the next protocol that we are going to go through is also for offering connectivity between different devices forming the connectivity and this protocol is the six low pan protocol. So, this six low pan protocol is basically it runs over IPv6 that is from where this six figure comes. So, it is from IPv6. So, it runs over IPv6. So, it offers radio connectivity radio linkages over IPv6 protocol. So, using IPv6 protocol and IPv6 as we know is for addressing it is an addressing protocol and it is very popular for use uh, for addressing in the case of IoT networks because of the large address space that is required for IoT. So, let us look at this six low pan protocol. So, it stands for six low pan stands for low power wireless personal area network over IPv6 and it allows for the smallest devices and each of these devices having limited processing ability to transmit information wirelessly over the internet protocol. So, we have low power small devices limited processing capability as is typical of IoT systems and wireless communication being present. So, so it basically helps in uh, establishing connectivity in this kind of networks. So, it basically helps the six low pan protocol it helps and allows to have these low power devices to connect over the internet because IPv6 is going to be used for addressing. So, uh, at the net network layer. So, that is the reason why uh, this protocol is useful for connecting these IoT networks these low power devices to the internet. It is basically created out of the IT RFC 5933 and RFC 4911. So, these are the two different uh, RFCs based on which this six low pan protocol is specified. So, this specification is available in these RFCs. So, these are some of these features of six low pan it allows IEEE 802.15.4 radios that means, the in the previous lecture we have gone through uh, this particular protocol which is useful for setting up uh, connectivity uh, between the different nodes and it primarily operates at the physical and the MAC layers. So, the radios of the 802.15.4 is used to carry 128 bit addresses of the IPv6. So, basically 6 low pan is an uh, an aggregation or it is a it is joining uh, you know conceptual joining of uh, 802.15.4 radios with IPv6, but how it is made possible because you know 802.15.4 it is low power lightweight protocol and IPv6 is not lightweight. So, how it is made possible? So, the header it is possible with the help of header compression and address translation techniques that basically helps to convert 802.15.4 radios to access the internet. So, it will help this 802.15.4 radios to access the internet using header compression and address translation techniques. IPv6 packets are compressed and reformatted to fit the 802.15.4 packet structure. So, uh, this is what is done IPv6 packets large in size they have to be compressed they have to be reformatted and they have to be mapped with the packet format of 802.15.4 which is primarily meant for low power networks small scale low power networks as is typical of IoT. So, it can be used for IoT 6 low pan can be used for IoT smart grid applications, smart home applications, M 2 M applications and many other different similar applications. So, for addressing in 6 low pan there are two types of addresses that are used 16 bit short address which is for pan specific communication that means, it is assigned by the pan coordinator for communicating within the pan 
the personal area network and the 64 bit extended address which is used for global unique connectivity global unique addressing throughout the network. So, IPv6 multicast is not supported by 802.15.4 and IPv6 packets are carried as link layer broadcast frames in the case of 6 low pan. So, we have in front of us the packet format of 6 low pan. So, as we can see over here if we look very closely we have 802.15.4 and IPv6 club together 802.15.4 radio and IPv6 for addressing over the internet. And these corresponding fields are also shown over here. So, what we have for corresponding to IPv6 we have the source address the destination address and these different other IPv6 fields that are typical uh, in uh, in this particular uh, protocol IPv6 protocol. And for 802.15.4 as well there is this source uh, the destination uh, both of which are 64 bits that means source and destination together will become 128 bits. Then we have this pan ID uh, because you know when we are talking about 15.4 we are talking about a personal area network. So, the pan ID is basically stored in this particular field. And so, so, this is how the 6 to pan packet format looks like. So, that is the packet format. Now, what about the header? There are three different types of headers. One is known as the dispatch header, the second one is known as the, uh, the mesh addressing header and the third one is known as the fragmentation header. So, let us look at these three different headers. The format of these headers are given over here. So, how many bits do we have? We have 8, 16, 24, 32. So, the header is 32 bits long. So, out of which the first two bits are used to identify the dispatch type. And this dispatch type basically helps in the dispatch communication, initiating the communication, initiating the communication. Now, this dispatch field has 6 bits. So, it is 6 bits long field and this basically identifies the next header type and thereafter the next rest of the bits are used to specify the type specific header and that is determined by the dispatch header. So, then we have the mesh ad addressing header and he here basically the first two bits are used to store the ID of the mesh addressing header. The next field the V field is 0 if the originator is a 64 bit extended address and it is 1 if it is the 16 bit address and we have seen that both of these are possible to have 16 bit as well as 64 bit address. The f field is 0 if the destination is 64 bit address and 1 if it is 16 bit address and the hop left hops left are decremented by each node before sending to the next hop. So, how many hops are left until the final destination node? This is basically stored in this particular field and is decremented as I said hop by hop. When one hop is over it is complete that field the value is decremented by 1. And the third header type is the fragmentation header and the corresponding fields are shown over here. So, in this case the first fragment has this structure the header has this structure as shown over here and the subsequent fragments have this particular structure. So, as we can see over here the main difference between the first fragment and the 
subsequent fragments is the inclusion of the datagram offset. So, this datagram offset basically shows that it will give the value of what are the subsequent frames that are there. So, this will basically help uh, 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 to connect with the first frames. So, six loop n because it involves a strong network layer component, it takes care of routing. So, the most important type of routing is a mesh based routing and this mesh based routing is used in the context of a pan topology, personal area network topology. So, the routing is used uh, routing basically is based on the IPv6 protocol in the personal area network domain and there are two protocols that are used in 6 low pan for routing. One is the load NG protocol, the other one is the RPL protocol. And as we can see over here from this particular figure, we have this IPv6 domain and we have this personal area network a pan and with the help of this coordinator of the gateway, it connects to the IPv6 network that means, the IPv6 based internet. The load NG routing protocol, it is primarily a derivation from the AODP protocol that is available and was proposed for ad hoc networks and it this has been used and extended for IOT networks. So, this load NG protocol has few different PDUs. The first one is the load request PDU and it is generated by a load NG router the originator for discovering a route to the destination. So, the forwarding of such route requests take place until they reach the destination load NG router. Then comes the route reply which is generated upon receipt of the route request by the indicated destination and unicast hop by hop forwarding of these route replies towards the originator. There is also this route error message that is used to return errors to the originator of the data in the event that there is some route breakage that takes place. So, optimized routing is supported reducing the overhead that is incurred by the route request generation and flooding. Only the generation is permitted sorry only the destination is permitted to respond to the route request intermediate routers of load NG are explicitly prohibited from responding to the route requests, even if they have been very active in terms of seeking routes and generating routes in the network. The route request and route reply messages are generated by a given load NG router and they share a single unique monotonically increasing sequence number. Next comes the RPL routing protocol, which is based on the distance vector routing for lossy and low power networks. So, this is where this L comes from this lossy and uh, so it is used for lossy networks as well as low power networks for routing. So, it maintains a routing topology using low rate beaconing, beaconing rate over here increases on detecting inconsistencies with respect to situations such as load failure or a link failure. Routing information is included in the datagram itself. It uses two types of routing proactive routing for maintaining routing topology and reactive for resolving routing inconsistencies. The RPL basically separates the packet processing and forwarding from the routing optimization objective which helps in low power lossy networks the LLMs. So, this particular protocol it supports features such as confidentiality, integrity, ensuring integrity, validating data paths and detecting the presence of loops. The overall optimization objectives of routing includes minimizing the energy, minimizing the latency and satisfying the constraints with respect to node power, bandwidth, etcetera. This RPL protocol 
operates using bidirectional links. So, there is bidirectional flow of communication of messages. So, in some LLN scenarios that means, the lossy scenarios these links may exhibit asymmetric properties. Right. So, basically asymmetric property means that while the message is sent from the source to the, re uh, the recipient it flows through one route may be directly, but because of all these environmental situations or whatever the response or the flow of message in the other direction does not take place through the same route may be it comes back through another route. So, it is asymmetric. So, it is required that the reachability of a router be verified before the router can be used as a parent. Finally, for this particular lecture we are going to go through the protocol RFID. RFID is very popular, it is commonly used, it is still used, it has been in use for long, it is still used shopping malls, uh, then uh, workplaces, you know for example, the ID cards uh, are fitted with RFID tags, RFID uh, tags can be scanned in the RFID uh, readers. Similar things happen in the shopping malls like when we go for purchasing certain items for example, clothings and so on, these also are fitted with these RFID tags and these RFID tags can be, uh, can, can be used to scan against RFID readers to get further information and so on. So, how does RFID work and RFID is we have to remember that sensor networks and RFID. Sensor networks we have not yet covered, we will cover in a subsequent lecture, but RFIDs and sensor networks and also other technologies such as Zigbee, 802.15.4 for W pans, NFC also which is very similar to RFID, these are different other connectivity offering uh, uh, mechanisms that are popularly used for IoT applications. So, these are the core for establishing connectivity in IoT networks. So, going back to RFID we have, so first of all RFID the it is an acronym, it is an acronym for radio frequency identification. So, where the data is digitally encoded in these RFID tags and these data can be read from the RFID tags. So, RFID tags are encoding the data and these data can be scanned from the RFID tags by the RFID reader. So, it is very similar to the barcoding schemes and QR coding schemes. So, in a barcode what happens? In a barcode like in libraries etcetera, in a bar, so by barcoding schemes are typically used to store information about the books and uh, you know having the identifiers for the books. So, the barcodes basically are like vertical lines right. So, so there is a barcode reader which can read those vertical lines the barcodes. Similarly, there is the QR code which is sort of like a that square square kind of thing which is used for scanning the data right. So, these are the QR codes. So, there is that reader which can take that image and it can uh, it can basically process that image to identify the data that is embedded in that particular code. So, RFID tags are also very similar in operation to the barcodes and QR codes, but the functionality or the way these operate are vastly different. So, let us now try to understand how RFID tags the RFID principle works. So, every RFID tag consists of an integrated circuit and an antenna. So, basically it is a very small the small tag. So, tag inside the tag there is some circuitry that is there and a small and antenna which is embedded into it inside it. So, this antenna is going to use it, it is going to be used for communication with the outside world that means outside the tag and this circuitry basically does number of things including storing the information in that particular tag. Maybe the RFID tag could be for a smart card that can be used for storing 
employee information. So, you know employees have employees in an organization have uh, different uh, identification uh, uh, for different identifiers and these those identifiers the different data can be stored in electronic form inside the chip that is built into these RFID tags. So, the RFID tag consists of integrated circuit and an antenna the tag is covered by a protective material. So, outside the tag is some kind of a shield a protective material which can also act as a shield against various environmental effects. The tags can be of two types one is the passive tag the other one is the active tag. So, passive tags are more common and uh, the way these passive tags are operated are through the process of inductivity. So, inductively when these passive tags when these tags come in proximity to the RFID reader there is some inductive effect some magnetic force fields are created due to which the information is transferred from the tag to the reader or from the uh, and, and vice versa. So, from the tag to the reader and vice versa. So, on the other hand so those are the passive tags on the other hand the active tags they have their own little source of power supply. The working principle of RFID is similar to its predecessor which is called the AIDC. The AIDC full form is automatic identification and data capture technology. So, it performs object identification, object data collection and mapping of the collected data to computer systems with little or no human intervention. So, the concept of RFID is basically adopted from AIDC which is its predecessor. So, AIDC is no longer very common however, the difference is RFID is mostly wireless not mostly it is fully wireless on the other hand AIDC uses wired communication. So, RFID basically uses radio waves that means, wireless communication to perform the different functions which are also performed by AIDC. So, let us try to understand how RFID works. Let us say that there is a tagged item, let us say that there is a tagged item like a clothing or something in a shopping mall some kind of a cloth. So, this cloth is tagged with this RFID reader not sorry RFID tag it is tagged with this RFID tag it is attached to the RFID tag this RFID tag consists of the circuitry some kind of a coiling mechanism and the cover. This cover is some kind of a polymer some plastic or some other polymer and the circuitry is basically stored inside this particular tag. Then we have this one if we look, uh, look over here. So, we have this part we have this part which basically is for the reader. So, this part is for the RFID tag and this part is for the RFID reader. Now, as we can see over here this RFID reader has a software and a source of power supply and it also has a coil and when you bring that reader which has is has a coil inside some magnetic coil then there is this magnetic inductive effect producing these magnetic lines of force are created. So, this is how the data that is there in that small chip inside the RFID tag is transferred to the RFID reader with the help of this force field magnetic force field. RFID tags and RFIDs in general are useful for supporting different IoT applications such as inventory management, asset tracking in an organization, personal tracking you know who is coming when, who is leaving when in an organization what is their attendance. So, attendance tracking systems for example, 
controlling access to restricted areas. So, you know whoever is authorized will be having an RFID tag and they can bring it clo clo in close proximity to the RFID reader and if it is a valid tag then that person the door is going to open for that person and the person can get in. So, it is used for controlling access to the restricted areas. ID badging, so basically you know identity, identity badges, smart cards in an organization it is used for that. Supply chain management, counterfeit prevention particularly in the uh, pharmaceutical industry. So, these are different applications of the RFID tags. So, with this we come to an end of this particular uh, lecture and there are few other protocols that are also very much useful uh, and we are going to go through them in the next lectures. Thank you.